So today we're kicking off a series that we're just calling Hope Is. And really what we're going to do over these next several weeks is we're going to just talk about how God brings that power through us to bring us to the place God wants us to be, to help us engage in the journey of life that he has for every one of us individually, uniquely, but yet according to his word. And to do that, we're going to kind of break down the, what we call the four pillars, the four promises that God gives us in Scripture. In fact, they're the four foundational principles that we built this church off of. So it's kind of that here's hope, but here's hope as well. So I hope today that you'll just enter in with us. We're going to look at Exodus chapter 6 is where we're going to go. And you know me how I teach. We'll get there eventually. Uh, but Exodus chapter 6 is where I want you to kind of find your place because we're going to spend the most time there. But today we're going to begin with this thought, and that is hope is found in God's promises. <clears throat> Aren't you glad for the promises of God? Aren't you glad that they are for us? They are, they're not for a select few. They are for us. In fact, today, I want us to look at his promises to us because our God has given us amazing thoughts, amazing privileges, amazing plans for our lives. Just as he gives us vision for a church, he gives us vision for our own lives, and that comes through God's promises. Because I believe this. It's, it's, very, it's very simple to me, and I believe this fully, and that is this, that God has more for all of us than we're currently experiencing in our lives. I believe that in my whole heart. I believe God has more for this ministry than we are experiencing right now. I know this because of God's promises. So what should we know about God's promises to us? Second Peter kind of gives us the, the, the framework. Second Peter 1, 4 says this, those, through, these, through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So right off the bat, I want you to see two things about God's promises that, that are for every single one of us. Number one, they help us participate, he says, in the divine nature. Can I tell you, a Christian life is not a natural life. In fact, God did not call us to himself for us to live on our own wisdom, on our own strength, on our own knowledge. In fact, it's a shame that so often we are better at the world's wisdom than we are about God's wisdom. But the word says, through his promises, we participate in that divine nature. The second thing he does, he says, now we have the ability to escape the corruption of this world. Can I get a yes to that? That we no longer have to live the way the world lives and, and freak out and live in fear and anxiety and worry and all the ways the world lives. Why? Because we have God's word in us. And through his word, we have a powerful weapon. And that's where the promises of God come in because they are those weapons that keep us focused on God's promises and not our own ability. So we think about promises. And every time I teach on promises, I, I get that look on people's face like, oh, Mike, I've been promised so much. And isn't that true? It's a shame, but in the world, we, we know that promises, the definition of promise is this, an offer with a guaranteed result. And you're like, yeah, but I've had so many promises broken in my life. I've learned not to trust. I've had, I've had so many people that, that say they're going to come through for me, but they, they don't. But yet we serve a God who is faithful to his word. We serve a God that is not a man that he should lie. We serve a God who doesn't break promises. He is in a covenant relationship with us. He's not in a contract relationship. If it's all about a contract, then, then we can break that anytime we want to. We do it all the time. I mean, if it's a contract, we'll all legal up, and, and that way we can get our rights. But no, God is in a covenant relationship. He says, you're my people. If you're my people, I care for you. If you're my people, I provide for you. If you're my people, I, I, I do everything you need, but you trust in me. In fact, when God gives a promise, he always comes through. Maybe not in the way we expect it. Maybe not in the timing we expect it, right? But our God always does what he says. In the early uh, stories of the Old Testament, in Joshua, the early leaders said this. They said in Joshua 21, 45, not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one of them was fulfilled. Now, now make no mistake, Israel failed quite often, but God never did. His promises were always there. In the New Testament, uh, he even kind of brought a little extra strength to the thought of God's promises in the book of Hebrews. I want to read this out of the message version. It'll be on the screen this morning. And it says this. It says, when God wanted to guarantee his promises, he gave his word, a rock solid guaranteed, for God can't break his word. And because his word cannot change, the promise is likewise unchangeable. And we who have run for our very lives to God have every reason to grab the promise hoped 
that the promised hope with both hands and never let go. It's an unbreakable spiritual lifeline. Isn't that awesome? It's an unbreakable spiritual lifeline, reaching past all appearances right to the very promise of God. That's our God. That's the promise that he makes to us. So there's three things we need to know about God's promise before we dive into these four pillars today. The first one is this. We just need to know God's promises. How do I claim it if I don't know it, right? How do I take hold of it if I can't, if I can't understand it? Uh, David, King David said in 1 Chronicles 7, 19, 17, 19, Lord, for the sake of your servant and according to your will, you have done this great thing and made known all these great promises. You say, well, Mike, where do I find them? How do I know God's promises? Well, he's given them to us in his word. The Bible's a book of promise. How many of you have a promise book at home? Does anybody have a, remember the old promise books that was kind of a, put it aside beside your Bible? It was where they took scriptures and they kind of categorized them according to promises. Why? Because the Bible is the book of promise. It's a lifeline that leads us in the very promise, I mean, the very presence of our God. You know, I, I believe this, there's a promise in God's word for every situation you can imagine. There's a promise in God's word for every circumstance you've ever wandered into. Think about this. We sang about battles today. We sing about that victory this morning. The Bible tells us that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. It tells us that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Why? Because he loved us. Some of you need to remind yourself, I am more than a conqueror. Guys, the battles we face are already won. The Christian life is not about winning. It's already been done. It's about standing on the promise of God that says, I stand on the side of victory, and I bring that into my life by faith. Maybe money is an issue to some. I know in the pandemic, that's been a, a real trial. And we think about the food pantry. What we're doing is we're giving hope every week. We're, we're providing hope to people, saying, here, now you don't have to go buy groceries. But money, according to Philippians 4.19, my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. Somebody needs to hear that my God wants to take care of you. My God wants to provide for you. But you've got to open your life up to him. You've got to trust him. It's many people battle fear, but the word of God says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? What shall I fear? For the Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I don't know about you, but when I'm not feeling well, I go to God's promises. When I'm struggling with my mind, I go to God's promises. When things feel uncertain, I go to God's promises. He says, bless the Lord who heals all my diseases. We celebrate it every week at communion. When I'm not feeling safe, the Lord will bless my coming and going both now and forevermore. I have a pastor friend who, who really has really bad humor. But he's like, Mike, God's even got a promise if you go to the dentist. I'm like, oh, come on. And he reads to me Psalm 81.10. Open wide your mouth and I will fill it. And I'm like, yeah, crowning with many crowns. I get it. Come on. You see, when life doesn't make sense, some of y'all are slow this morning. When life doesn't make sense, you got to learn to hang on to God's promises. So number one, you got to know them. Number two, you need to understand God's promises. Some people get frustrated. And I think God is, God is all about false advertising. You're like, well, I don't see it in my life. Well, let me tell you why maybe you don't see it in your life. You see, the Bible's clear. God is not like us. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not human that he should lie. Not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? I mean, it's, it's rhetorical is, is how it's being asked there. But we have to understand what happens when he makes the promises. Because his promises are both unconditional and conditional at the same time. Let me explain. They're both unconditional and conditional at the same time. Unconditionally is this. His promises are eternal. He does not change his mind. He does not change his word. And they were made before the earth was formed. God didn't come up with promises because we're good. <laughs> no, he made them before we ever, ever walked on this earth. They're offered to all of us today. But most of his promises are conditional. And, I, and when I say conditional, it means this. Every promise has a premise. There is a role for us to play when it comes to walking in God's promises. You, you get that nod your head this morning. Some of you are not nodding. Okay, we're going to work on that. 
I can see y'all now, by the way. We've done some new lighting in here, and y'all are not just this void darkness anymore. I actually see your faces, and you look really cool today, by the way. It's nice to see some smiling faces. But his promises are conditional. Although God is the one who fulfills his promises, we have responsibilities in the process. In fact, I think there's three things, according to God's word, that, that are on us when it comes to God's promises. And the first is this, and that is we must be living in obedience toward God. You know, I have people like, Pastor, you know, you said God will provide all my need, but man, I've got bills and I've got this and I, I'm just not seeing it flowing. I said, are you being generous in your life? Well, no. Okay, then. Give and it will be given to you. Press down, shaken together, running over. It's not a matter of God just dropping something from heaven. There's a, there's a covenant relation that God, I trust you in my finance. You see, when we're not living in obedience to God, we hinder our relationship to him. Secondly, you got to ask in faith. See, I knew we'd get to faith. You got to ask in faith. Well, Mike, what is faith? Faith is that expectation that what God has promised will come to be. And we boldly step out into it and we take hold of things by faith. It doesn't matter how we feel. It doesn't matter what things look like. We say, God, this is your word. We trust it because God is not a man that he would lie. In fact, without faith, the word says, it's impossible to please God. So we've got to walk in obedience. We've got to learn to, to ask in faith. And third, and this is where a lot of people get tripped up, and that is we, we have to be patient and wait for his timing. Oh, don't you wish it was your timing always? You know, the only thing in the Bible says to be instant in is in prayer. It doesn't say he comes instantly, but he says we are to be instant in prayer. Our, our, our lips should always be in that communication with God. But here's the thing about God's promises. He knows exactly when to fulfill them. He knows exactly what we need when we need it. And we have to learn to trust his judgments. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. So what does that mean? It is done, right? And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. So when we claim that promise, what we're doing is we're saying, all right, God, so be it. Let it be done. Now we wait. Now we watch. Now we don't go out and try to make it happen on our own, somebody. Now we don't come out and try to play God. Now we can let God do what only God can do, but we continue to pursue his precious promises. And that's the next point. I need to learn to pursue his promises. I need to go after them. I love the psalmist David. I love, I love his heart. I know he was messed up like all of us, but he, I love his heart. And he said in Psalm 119, he said, God, your promises have been thoroughly tested and your servant loves them. In Psalm 119, 148, my eyes stay open through the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promises. What's he saying? He says he is constantly looking for God. He's constantly engaging God into his life. He's thinking about what God has promised. He's chasing after what God has promised. He's not giving up. Why? Because he puts his hope in God who created him. You see, we said the definition of a promise is an offer with a guaranteed result. Well, I can guarantee you this. <laughs> I can guarantee you that you will live a better life when you pursue God. I can guarantee you that. I, I, can, I can take that to the bank. Your life will be different when you begin to trust God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. The word says the steps of the righteous are what? They are ordered by God. Well, that's something we can trust, amen? So we gotta learn his promises. And there are four core promises he makes in scripture. It's the ancient of days. It goes back to the beginning of his people, the children of Israel. And yet all through the word of God, we find it creeping into and moving over into the New Testament for every one of us, these same four principles, these four core promises. It's what, the, what we built Hope Church around, these four pillars that were promises God made over 3,000 years ago, but are still in effect to us today. And we find them in Exodus 6, verses 6 through 7. If you're not familiar, it's the story of the Israelites. They had gone down to Egypt because of a famine in the land. Uh, go back and read the story of Joseph. You get the beginnings of all this. And, and, and yet over the years, things changed and different people rose up in power in Egypt and now they're in slavery. Not only are they in slavery, but now they're, they're growing in bondage to such a point that their cries are going out to God and God heard them. And he came out of compassion to them and brought them a deliverer who was going to be Moses to bring them out. And, we, and where we read this scripture, it's right after Moses had gone to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, oh, I'll show you. And he made it harder. He made it more difficult. 
They took the straw away and said, you still have to provide just as many bricks. They beat them. It was a horrible circumstance. And God said something. He says, Moses, you tell my people this. Exodus 6, verses 6 through 7. Say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Can I tell you, so much of our lives can be defined in this one thought, and that is God is constantly bringing us out to bring us in. He is constantly bringing us out to bring us in. He did it with the children of Israel, and he does it in our lives today. And he does it in a very clear way. Did you notice the, the I wills? That were stated there. He ever four times, he says, I will free you. I will redeem you. I will take you as my people. Then you will know that I am your God. These four I wills are celebrated at every Passover by, by the Jewish people. It is part of their understanding their history. It is their, part of their Independence Day celebration, so to speak. It is those four I wills that remind them of God's great power, and they're still in God's heart for us today, because God is constantly moving us from where we are to where he wants us to be. In fact, that's the only way we define success around here. It's not nickels and noses. It's not buildings. It's not programs. It's God moving people from where they are to where he wants you to be. And can I tell you, every one of you are in process. I'm in process. There are things God wants to do in my life that has not been done yet. There are things that I, I'm in the way of, and there's things that he has not yet revealed. He is constantly moving us from where we are to where he wants us to be, and he does it through these promises. Check it out. Just kind of get a picture in your mind, because this is where we're going to go over these next few weeks. Today's kind of an overview, and then I'm going to break these all down independently. But number one, he promises to rescue us from bondage. You say, Mike, what's bondage? Anything that controls your life outside of God. Anything that takes hold of your life outside of God. That's why we believe you to begin by discovering hope. Where we find hope, we find hope when we encounter God. It's not about encountering church. It's about encountering God. We serve a God that wants to be known and knows you by name, but he's waiting for you. He wants to rescue you from bondage. Here's the second thing he does. He promises to deliver you from whatever holds you back. Oh, it breaks my heart when I, when I hear people talk and I, I see that they're being held back. They're being held back by the past. They're being held back by, by bad habits of thought. They're being held back by heritage. They're hanging on to some family tradition that's not a good tradition or a way of thinking. And can I tell you, God wants to break you free. God wants to set us free. And that's why we, we begin our second step of our next steps is experiencing freedom. That we believe this, every one of us, when we are saved, brings a lot of junk into our relationship with God. And he wants to break that out of us so that we can truly walk in his freedom. We want to help you do that. We want to help you experience that. But he promises that. He promises also to help us discover his original intention for your life so that we may find purpose. Did you know God had an intention for your life when you were knit together in your mother's womb? He didn't wait to see how you were going to do and go, oh, oh, I see. Yeah, I can, I can help them do that. No, he had an intention for every one of our lives. Sin messed it up. We know that. Sin destroys, sin goes to death, but God says he's come to give us life and life more abundantly to rediscover his purpose. And we want to help you do that. And we, we do that through some teaching. We do that in our groups. And then finally, my favorite part is he promises to make you part of a family that's making a difference in the world. Isn't it awesome to make a difference? Isn't it cool to recognize what you do makes a difference? I, I don't know I don't know how you see things. I know how I only know and can confirm how I see things. But I, I, I was out there Thursday night and Justin came by and just said something about pantry. And I, I just told him, I said, this is such a humbling moment every time we do this. And he, why is it humbling? That God trusts us. That God will work through us. That God will do that which we cannot do. Why? Because we're part of a family that he made to make a difference in the world. So let's break these down. Let, let's kind of look at them individually. And then we're going to set ourselves up for these next few weeks. Are you with me? Come on, talk to me this morning. Amen? Yeah. Come on. You get all loud for Mel. I'm getting jealous over here. And then y'all get all quiet for me. Come on. She's special. I get it. I know. She's Mel. And she's Mike. All right. Let's break these down. You ready? Let's start with the first one. He says, look at this. He goes, I will bring you out. 
I will bring you out. You realize the children of Israel could do nothing to break themselves out of slavery. They couldn't rise up and overwhelm the Egyptians. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't barter themselves out of it. No, they were stuck. They were enslaved. There was no way out. And yet God says, I will bring you out. His first desire is to get us out of the bondage that we are in. I mean, before anything else, he promises us salvation. He promises something that we can't do anything about. Listen, you can't save yourself, can you? There, there's, there's, not a, there's not a good work you can do. There's not a church membership that's going to stand as the evidence of coming into God's family. There's nothing we can do because God says, I am the one who saves you. You see, salvation is not being religious. It's not shaking a preacher's hand as we do in the South or getting dunked in a tank or, or joining a membership role. No, it is saying to him, I surrender all because I can't do anything about this. But God, you said you can. And God is faithful to his word where he brings us into repentance, which means he just changed direction. It means we were going this way, which is the world's way. Not that y'all are the world's way. We'll just go that way. We're going that way. And God says, I want you to go that way. Because only in repentance do we then discover real life. It's only then where we get our life back, the life he intended for us. I know this is a little bit long, but just read it with me. It's out of Titus chapter 3. I think it's one of the best descriptions of salvation in the Word. And I really particularly like it in the message version. So just, just go with it, all right? It says this. It wasn't so long ago that we ourselves were stupid and stubborn. Let's just stop right there. I'm not calling anybody stupid, okay? Don't write me emails. It's right here in the Word. That we were stupid and stubborn, dupes of sin, ordered every which way by our glands, going around with our chip on our shoulder, hated and hated back. Come on now. 2020 all wrapped up in one scripture right there. That's the life without Jesus. Did you hear me? That's the life without Jesus. Angry, bitter, no peace chip on the shoulder, highly offended, easily offended, stubborn, being driven by our glands here and there. But when God, our kind and loving Savior, God stepped in, he saved us from all of that. It was all his doing. We had nothing to do with it. He gave us a good bath, and we came out of it new people, washed inside and out by the Holy Spirit. Our Savior Jesus poured out new life so generously. God's gift has restored our relationship with Him and given us back our lives. And there's more life to come, an eternity of life. You can what? Count on this. Why? Because His promises are guaranteed. You see, it's the promise of salvation. He wants to bring us out of the bondage of sin and bring us into a loving relationship where Jesus Christ is our Lord. And he walks with us. Can I tell you, the life of sin wears you out, doesn't it? The life of trying to handle life all on your own wears you out. Trying to live in the philosophies of men wears you out because they're always shifting. They're always changing. But God says there's a way to life and we find it through his son, Jesus Christ. And I want hope to be that. I've always dreamed of that church of people who are weary of the ways the world can come in and discover new life through Christ. Maybe you haven't experienced that. Maybe you're watching or listening in today. You haven't experienced that new life because somehow someone has told you there's something you've got to do. Well, if you clean your act up, you know, if you get yourself right, then God will accept you. Can I tell you, there's one thing that is in common of every world religion except one. And that is that they all require you to do something to get to God but not Christianity. Christianity is there's no hoops to jump through. There's no class to attend. God said, I will bring you out. But remember those promises? But you got to take hold of it by faith. You got to say, yes, I agree. God, you are my deliverer. So God said, I'll bring you out. The second thing is he said, I will make you free. I, I will free you. You know, when we get saved spiritually, and our, our spirit man is made perfect in that moment. There, there, there's an there's a absolute radical transformation that takes place. And I, I love new believers, and they, they get that, but they're like, why am I still messing up? Because our flesh has a long ways to go. There, there's a lot in our natural man that needs to change after we have been saved. It's kind of like a baby. You know, you don't, you don't expect a baby to like get behind the steering wheel and go, right? There's a, there's a living life there, but there's a lot of growing to do. So God says, I will make you free. He promises us deliverance. Now, people freak out at that word deliverance. I, I wish we had a better word, but it's what it is. 
Hollywood has made it look like that's you know when like they're full of demons and there's uh, you know like green stuff comes out of their mouth, their head spins around. That that's deliverance, but that's not deliverance. That's Hollywood. Deliverance is applying God's word to the reality of your life and watching the chains fall off. Deliverance is applying God's word to the specific bondages in your life and seeing the chains fall off. You see, it comes in that place where we find ourselves seeking God, and yet we know there's things of our flesh that are still trying to rule, and we say, no, no longer will you rule my life. I'm not driven by my appetites, but by God's word, because God's word sets us free. That's why we call it freedom group here and not freedom class. It's not just learning the promise, but it's also engaging with people around you who will help you in those promises because how many know we struggle when we're on our own we struggle when we try to do things just by ourselves and we need that you see salvation takes care of eternity but deliverance determines this quality of life this power of the life god has given us you see think about it with the children of israel if you if you follow the story through exodus god got them out of egypt but how many know it took a long time to get egypt out of them right I mean, they were free, but they kept living like slaves. That's why there's all the dietary laws when you read in the New Testament, why you wonder why they're all there, all the laws about bathing and cleansing, because they had lived in slavery so long, they didn't know how to live as free. And God had to teach them. When the same way, when we come out of bondage, we are saved. God wants to get a lot of things out of us. He wants to change our lives. He wants to get us out of wrong thinking. And I think that's where most of our battles are, you know, right there. He gets us out of that wrong thinking, but he does it through freedom. He does it through allowing us to take God's word and get it into us. Can I be straight right now? This is something very comfortable you need to understand. All we have to get right to go to heaven is the first promise. Do you know that? It's salvation. But can I tell you, the second promise is where it starts getting fun. It's not just about getting to heaven, but now it's engaging in the journey and living in a way where where we say to to the world, you know what? Sin is no longer our master. But we are set free to live a life that honors God and ultimately makes a difference. The children of Israel struggle with that. When things got hard, what do they do? Can we go back to Egypt? Oh, my goodness. I can't imagine. Can you? I mean, you've been beaten. You've been shackled. Your kids have been taken away from you. You you, you have no freedom at all. But when things get hard, like, I'll go back to slavery. No. But Satan's always whispering it was better back then. It was better back then. There was nothing better back then. I don't live for good old days. They weren't that good. I live for the new day that God has for me. I live for the next day, the next day, the next day. Why? Because God's bringing his good, his precious promises in my life. When I trust him, not only has he saved me, but he's setting me free from things like anger, from things like doubt, from things like fear. Why? Because he brings us to that place where we we may now know the joy of our salvation. I've always just struggled when I meet Christians that are bitter. And it's not an age thing. Can I tell you that? Well, they're bitter. And you know why I think they're bitter? Because they were told by somebody that all the, just get saved and there you go. Now, boy, life's just going to take off from there. You know what? It's, it's true. But it engages you engaging the promises of God. It's not about just God going, Shazam, everything's going to be perfect. You live in this little like Disney world with like little bird flies going around your head. No, it's real life. We started hope. We prayed, God, we want to be real hope for real people that are living in a real world. Not religious people that are faking it, trying to make it. And that's why we hurt. We say we hurt. And people come around and we say, okay, let's thank God's promises. Put them into our life because they bring freedom for us that we no longer have to go back and live as slaves any longer. There's a third promise. He said, I will redeem you. And, and sadly, can I tell you, most Christians never get here. I will redeem you. I like that word redeem. I, I grew up in the days of, what were they, green stamps? This is going to age some of us right now. Some of you are shaking your heads, right? You used to go to the grocery store and they'd give your mama stamps. I don't know why, but they got stamps. But if you collected enough of those stamps, guess what you got to do with them? You got to redeem them for something better. You got to turn them in for something better, and you got something back. When we think about redemption, what God is saying is, I know, not only do I want to restore you or redeem you, I want to restore you to your original condition. I want to make it better than it was ever before. I want to give you more than you ever expected. 
It's not a matter if we can just get back to where we were. No, he wants to take you better. That's why I don't even like the descriptions of revival sometimes because revival says, oh, we can just get back to where we were. I don't want to go back where we were. There's more of God. There's more of his power. There's more of his strength. There's more of his direction in our lives. If we continue to look for it in redemption, redeeming us, he gives us that restoration. He gives us that place where now he's showing us again his power in our lives. But unfortunately, most people get stuck in, 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 in second, second gear, so to speak. They're saved, and they spend the rest of their life trying to overcome sin. And they never come to the point of realizing sin's already been overcome by God. We've got to learn to walk in the promises of God and let him restore us. Let him make us new. Let us reveal his newness in us. Let him do things for us that we could never do. Here's how I put it. The children of Israel were never meant to be slaves. They were not created to be slaves. They were set apart. They were holy. They were called to be a blessing to all nations. And in the same way, God did not save you and I, so we spend the rest of our lives trying to work out our own problems in our own strength. But that's what we do. We take the scriptures and we mess it up. Well, work out your own salvation. Fear and trembling. Hope you get it right. That's not what it means. No, he says he does something. He says he does something we can't do. He says, with mighty acts of judgment, I bring you out. With mighty acts of judgment. Not judgment on us. God's not up there going, you knuckleheads, you, I'm disappointed, you can't get it straight. No, he's bringing mighty acts of judgment toward anything that binds us. When we claim the power of his word, and we claim the blood of, blood of Jesus, and we find that freedom, and we let him restore us, and renew us, and make all things new in us, we get so much more once we're redeemed. It is that outstretched arm of God that works in us, but we still stand in that place, and one day I'll get my act together, pastor. No, you won't. Because you can't if you're the one doing it. But you put your trust in God. You begin to live according to his promises. You begin to walk in obedience even when it doesn't make sense. You begin to let God change your thinking and change your speech and think your, the way you act toward others. And all of a sudden, this new life that he brought in us begins to be revealed. That's that redemption. That's that restoration. But it comes when we put our hope there because God sees something you that you don't see. God sees greatness in every one of us, but we don't see it. I circled that in my notes. I said, if I said nothing else today but that, that's worth coming. God sees greatness in you. Maybe your daddy didn't see it. Maybe your mama didn't see it. Some of you are living your childhood over and over and over and over again. You never believe anything great can happen in you or through you. But can I tell you, it takes the power of a single yes to God. Where God does things in you that you can't even imagine. God does things through you you could have never dreamt of. But it comes when we take hold of His promises. We take hold of what God has taken hold of for us. I, I honestly believe this. I believe the world is hoping the church would get to this step. I believe the world is hoping Christians really would come to that place where we're not just caught gazing at our belly buttons wondering what's wrong with us, but getting out of that place of saying, God, you have set us free. God, you have redeemed us by mighty acts. And now, God, you have a purpose and a plan in us, God, that's going to change this world. That's God's plan. But Satan keeps us all messed up by just looking at our feet going, what's wrong with me? Ephesians 1 says it this way. It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us, had designs on us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and in everyone. Look, just, just do this. Point at yourself and say, that's me. Well, the two of you that believe that, that's awesome. Point at yourself and say, that's me. He's working out for everything and for everyone. See, guys, some of you need to get there and find out what this life's all about. We'll help you. That's what we, that's what we want to do. We want to come alongside you and discover that, how God has made you, how God has shaped you, because we're all uniquely different. Thank God for that. Because then he says, finally, I will take you to be my people. Isn't it cool to say I've got people? He said, I will take you as my own people. That's God's promise. That's God's promise to us, to put us in a family, 
that's better than any family that's on this earth. I mean, some of y'all have awesome families. Some of you have families you never talk about. Some of you have families you try to escape. But God has a family that he wants everyone to be part of. That's the family of God. He's given us a family. We belong. There's this ultimate place where we find fulfillment because Christianity is not about us out there just being on our own. It's being part of something bigger than ourselves and letting God make a difference through us that we can never make ourselves. I put it this way. He promises to make you part of a family that is making a difference in this world. Think about it. He gets you out. He gets it out of you. He shows you who you are, and then he puts you in a family. That's the promise of God. I, I love this description. I had to laugh at it because I, I grew up in church. I, I am privileged. I'm thankful. I was raised by a godly family, but I know what church families are like. And help me know that we are a unique bunch of people. I've never met a perfect church, have you? Because the moment I arrive, it gets imperfect really quickly. I've never met that. But I love this description. It was a guy, a guy named Preston Sprinkle wrote this. I just put the quote. I think it'll be on your screen. It says this, Christians are not solitary individuals. That's what's so wrong right now in this pandemic. We were turning Christianity into a spectator sport. It was never meant to be watched. I know that things have made it happen that we can't avoid that right now for some, but it was never meant to be watched. It's meant to be engaged, right? To be part of community. He says, it's not a solitary individual it's called to follow Jesus on our own and demand that others do the same. Hey, buck up. Come on. You can do it. No, that's not how it goes. He says, we're a community of radical misfits. Come on, Mel. We are a community of radical misfits. Would you agree? Come on. We just, we know it about ourselves. We don't joke. It is who we are. Called into a motley family filled with grace and truth so that no one should walk alone. I think we need t-shirts to say that. I really do. I, I mean, just forget the radical misfits for Jesus. There you go. It's like a new club we just started this morning. I can see some of you already designing the shirt right now. Why? Because God promised to do something with us only when we are together that we can never do ourselves. You know what? One of the reasons that we came to start Hope Church for three years, Denise and I were out of the family. We were, we were going around preaching, teaching to other families all around the state every weekend somewhere else. And you know what? It looks real glamorous, a lot of fun and all that. But here's what happens when the service is over. Guess what? They all go home. And you walk away and you go, I don't know anybody. After three years of doing that, we had a rough spot. And I sat in a hospital room one night and the doctor told me he thought my wife was dying. I had no family to call. My family was all back in Texas. But I had no family. And I believe with all my heart that's the moment God birthed hope in me. Because I believe in the local body of Christ. As motley and as messed up as we are, God chooses to work through us. And we have to engage. See, family relationship is not the same. We are born into natural families. We don't get to choose. We just showed up, right? But we have to engage to be part of a family. It's on us to be known and to know. It's on us to connect. It's on us. Why? Because there's a real thief out there that goes against everything God wants to do. John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But he, God came to give us life and life to the full. You see, when we are family, we circle up. We're family, we stand together. We don't do it perfectly. But we're family, we do things that are multiplied that we can never do ourselves. That's why I think one of the key verses of Scripture is Matthew 6, 33, and we're going to close with this. And that's just when God, Jesus said, but seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things, what things? The great and precious promises of God. All these things will be given to you as well. But you see, you have to choose. You have to choose to engage that. You can't, you can't approach Christianity as some kind of survival mode. If I can just survive, if I can just get to heaven, if I can just make it, that's not the life Jesus died for. He said, I've come to give you life and life to the full. But it begins when we engage these four promises. God, pull us out of Egypt. God, deliver us. 
God, get Egypt out of us. Free us. Free us, God. God, redeem us. <laughs> Lord, make us new. Make us see what you intended before sin. Never mess it up. And God, bring us into fulfillment, God. Put us part of a family. God, we accomplish something we can never accomplish alone. Church, we've got to get there. And we will. And we are. But you got to choose. God is for us, not against us. He knows you by name, and he's calling you to engage. Would you stand with me this morning? See, I, I believe today that I'm speaking to four, four different types of individuals. I really believe I'm speaking to people that are bound, and they don't know how they got there. You know where you are, but you're not sure how you got there. Why am I anxious all the time? Why am I fearful? Why, why am I overwhelmed? Why is it I never catch a break? Why is it I'm alone? But you really can't answer how you got there. But I know this about you. You're ready to leave that. God wants to bring you in. I'm speaking to other people who are drifted away. Oh, there were times you say, Mike, I know what that feels like. I, I remember when God set me free. I, I know my purpose, and I, I know it is to be part of something bigger than me, but life has caused you to just kind of drift back. Now you're solitary. Now you're living in the 20 years ago. Now something hung you up that's holding you back, and God says, no, I want to set you free of that. There's a third group of people I'm speaking to. <laughs> They're the religious but empty. They think they've got all the answers. They're just not living it out. They can tell you what's wrong with you, but deep inside there's this emptiness. God never saved us to make us religious. We're not called to go through the motions, put on an act, so that someday we'd be with him. No, he made us to make a difference. And then they're finally this morning, there are those of you that know Jesus you're ready for eternity. There's, there's something inside of you that says, come now, Lord. But if not, Lord, I'm in the game. Use me. Use me, God, that others may know you. So wherever you are this morning in this journey, success is God moving you from where you are to where he wants you to be. I don't know what that is for you. I know what it is for me. And I pray for you this morning what I pray for myself. God, help us. God, help us to be so engaged with who you are, God. Lord, that we learn to live according to your promises, God, and not the wisdom of this world. God, I pray that we'd be so engaged with you, O oh God, that, Lord, we would, God, let go of those things that hold us back. Lord, Scripture, scripture describes as, as taking the weights off that are, that are hindering us, holding us back from running the race, God. And I pray that, Lord, by your mighty hand, God, Lord, we let you make us free. God, I pray this morning, Lord, that we truly do get that picture that you see of us. God, not what others have said about us. God, not, not that picture even we paint of ourselves, oh God, but Lord, how you see us. And God, I pray this morning, God, that we make a choice that we will not walk alone. God, we will not walk alone. Lord, you sent your son to die for us. God, you sent your son to give us life. God, you send us your Holy Spirit to live in that resurrected life, God. And I pray today we engage it because we know this, God. God, you're still fighting for us. God, you're still making a way. But Lord, today we need to choose. And I pray today we choose life. Today I pray those that have never accepted Christ, never surrender their lives, just right where you are at home or in this place, just right in hell, pray it out to the Lord. Just speak it to him. That's what prayer is. Lord, I surrender my life to you. Because I want to find real life. God, I surrender my ways to you, God. Because, Lord, I want to walk in your ways. And God, I accept what Jesus did for me. And God, I ask you to forgive me. And give me new life. Father, I praise you. I give you.